Okay, with the director of Salt in the Ravines, uh, Rita Hankin uh, is with us. Uh, film from, uh, you're, well, you're based in Australia, but also, was it made at, in the United Kingdom? Like, it was, it was made in Indi Indi Indonesia, but then the, the origin was in the UK because you went to school there, but then you're also from Germany, correct? <laughs> Yes, <laughs> it's a little bit complicated. Um, the film Sword in the Veins was created in the framework of my um, university experience in the UK. Yeah. Um, I'm a German filmmaker currently based in Melbourne, Australia, and um, the film is about uh, sea people in Indonesia. So, it is, but it was done at, at your school, so Foul Mouth University. It was like a kind of a thesis film or was it, it was a university project? Yeah, so it's a university project. I studied marine and natural history photography um, for three years um, in the west coast of the UK. Uh, a fantastic course. And um, in my final project, I decided to um, take on that um, that challenge of creating a, a film by myself. And Sword in the Veins was the result of that um, of that final project at uni. Okay, so how does it how does how does it this this story come about? Like it's kind it's an, a kind of an amazing story. You're so you're in East Indonesia. You're with this community of sea. They're real, literally sea, sea people, and uh, basically they live. They're, it's all about the marine, the, the environment that they live in. Uh, what is it? They're known as uh, Bajo. Am I saying it right? They're known as Bajo. Yeah, Bajo. But, That's correct. And so, and they're kind of sea nomads, meaning that they just. They don't really have a, a, a home like you and I, perhaps, but I'm assuming you have a home, but they just kind of live off the sea and just amazing story. But how did you find this story? How did you find these people? So I have a very strong interest and passion for free diving. And um, I've been now free diving for many years and the Bajo people are quite, let's say, famous. Um, in that um, freediving world because they are considered the OG freedivers. They've yeah. been doing it for thousands of years and they have these incredible um, breath hold abilities and they do all the spear fishing and um, with homemade sling guns. And knowing that freediving world, I have heard about the Bajo before and um, I was really interested in filming um originally them doing their thing with the sea and living in peace with their marine environment and diving with them, seeing how they do all this spearfishing. So I extensively researched how to create access to their remote uh, communities. And um, eventually I um, achieved, I achieved that. And when I got to Indonesia for the first time, witnessing their their freediving skills, I soon noticed that there is so much more to tell about their life rather than just focusing on their on their freediving world. But that was the original thought that I had. So that was a seed, and then you, then you started to get to know them, and you're like, wait a minute, there's like a there's a more of a thematic story here. There's a big story here, and and uh, how did you get? These, how did you get these people to be in the film? I'm assuming they they just kind of live on their own. They don't see cameras. One would assume they don't see cameras very often, much less be in a documentary. How did you convince, like, like the spear diver, for example, how did you get him to be in the film? Um, so I was quite careful when I first um, reached out to them. Um, they don't have, um, there is no easy way to arrange that beforehand. So I um, managed to create a contact um, through a university a, a university contact, a guy named Sam Mansfield, who's affiliated with the BBC. Um, and he's been shooting with them previously. So I reached out to him. He gave me some tips. And then I just rocked up to their village. It was a three-day travel um, from, from Bali, so very remote. And um, I just, for the first time, introduced myself and stayed with them for one week, getting to know them, um, creating connections. And I didn't even bother to use my camera for the first few days. I just really wanted to um, to create a human connection, first, first of all. And then at some point, um, the people warmed up to me and I played a lot with their children and swam in the water with them. 
And from there on, very slowly, I started um, taking my camera out for some photos at first. And um, after a few months, I came back to that uh, community and then I started filming. And by then I had already made friends and um, I had established myself in their community a little bit. So um, the second time around, I came with a more structured plan on what I really wanted to um, to shoot. And, and uh, it was just you? Like were you, who, is else, who else was in the production, like shooting the film? Was it just you? Yeah, so the first time it was just me. I was a solo traveler. Yeah. And the second time around, I had my partner who was helping me um, with the travels, with the logistics. Um, but I didn't have any team behind me. It is a solo project. Okay, so the so let me let's talk about the the scene in the beginning of the film where you go underwater, which is is a fantastic scene. How did you shoot that? Like he he seems to be underwater for a, a long time. And but you're were you the you, like what kind of equipment did you need? Did you have, do you have experience doing that kind of camera work underwater under the ocean? Like I'm just curious about that sequence. Yeah, so all the underwater uh, footage that you can see in salt in their veins, um, it's uh, shot on a free diving setup. So I myself hold my breath. Um, I did, however, take the liberty to cut it a little too. bit, so it's not a concert. Yeah. So I'm I'm holding my breath um, with the badge of free divers, but it's uh, cut from several scenes together. Yeah. However, the badge they have an amazing breath hold, and they are able to stay underwater for a very long like, time. Like how long is a very uh, long time? We did time? come up. How long is a very long um, time? It depends. Um, it depends. Some of the older, very experienced freedivers, I would estimate, stayed underwater hunting for around two minutes. That's amazing. How about yourself? How long can you stay underwater? Um, when I practice, I can stay for maybe a minute and a half. That's pretty, that's impressive. I always felt there should be an Olympic event about that, like see how long you can stay underwater for. <laughs> yeah, it's amazing. <laughs> I was pretty good at him when I was a kid. Yeah. When I was a kid, we had a swimming pool in our backyard and I would like, I would like do it every, I would count. And I think I got to like a minute and like 40 seconds. And then people got scared. They would, they got scared that I was going to drown or something like that, even though I wasn't just that, but so I'm impressed. That's impressive. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I'll have genetics with, uh, with, uh, with, with uh, fishing or something like that, but it's like amazing <laughs> what they do because it's just old school I got a, I got a, a spear. I got like a, you know what I mean? I, I made it myself. I'm going to go into the water. I'm going to go into the ocean. I'm going to go to the bottom of the ocean. I'm going to try to try to make, make get dinner, I guess. Right. Like it's just amazing. Yeah. Yeah. It's so fascinating because the, they are so connected um, with the sea in a, in a really, really pure form. And they are very resourceful. So all the material is um, is homemade. They have um, wooden spears. They have wooden goggles. They don't use any weights like we do when we go free diving. Um, they don't use fins. So they yeah. are quite minimalistic in their approach. And they they hunt enough fish to feed their family and they don't take more. So there's just that really beautiful connection with the hunter and um the sea so i i loved to witness that a lot yeah and they're not it's not about like uh they're not polluting it because it's not about capitalism it's not about trying to get as much fish in one day trying to get as much lot like you know what i mean it's just about themselves it's about they love the ocean they're taking care of it they're hunting but they're still giving back you know what i mean it's like they're like these things this doesn't exist anywhere except for maybe perhaps here and maybe one one other place right but it's just amazing that you captured this on film yeah it's a fascinating background unfortunately though they are yeah. struggling so dc people um or the sea communities of bajo um various reasons environmental changes um adapting to the modern world um there are a lot of different factors that um 
make them in one way more disconnected over time with the yeah. sea. So um, they are struggling to to keep their traditional fishing methods alive. Yeah, and this the, and what I've learned too uh, is that is that the the sea is changing, right? Because fit the fish in the in the animals they're going. Because everything's polluted in different directions, everything they're all they're changing directions too, right? So everybody, the sea, the the ocean's evolving because of our man-made capitalistic greed. I guess I'm just being I'm talking bullet points, but I guess that's what's happening. I guess. Yeah, absolutely. When I was talking to the elders in the village, they were talking about years ago how there was an abundance of fish everywhere and it was very easy to fish even yeah. right by by their home. They're living on wooden uh, bamboo stills in the water in the tidal zones. So they said, oh, you just look around and there is fish everywhere. But now the, the seamen, they have to go further and further to find that richness in fish, and it's much harder. And um, overfishing costs, um, yeah, there to be way less fish for everyone. Yeah. Um, so that's a that's a big problem. And um, um, there's also um, the population of the sea people have risen, so more people are fishing. And in some of these areas, there's big fishing boat coming with big modern equipment. So. They, the barge or with their very, very small boats, they don't yeah. stand a chance in comparison. And the way you edited the film is that, obviously this was very deliberate, is that you're showing us this beauty, this individual kind of freedom with the ocean, this kind of like man, ver man with nature in the first seven minutes of the film. And then we just, as an audience, we can't, we're, we're taken back by it. We love it. And then you shift years and you kind of show us the pollution, the 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 conflicts that's happening, and then the, the second half is about like how this is going to end. So you kind of like tease the audience. We're like you give us beauty, and then you show us like this is this is going to be taken away from these people and from us as well, I guess too, right? Yeah, absolutely. So I really wanted to um show the the two sides because that's exactly how I felt when I was visiting. Yeah. I was able to witness the beauty, but I was um, also faced with the, the truth and the reality of their lives changing. So it was an important message for me personally to show that juxtaposition of tradition versus modern changes in their communities. Yeah, and it's like small, it's, it's, it's you know, there is we're beating a dead horse a little bit, but at the same time, it's like there it's just small thinking, right? They're just thinking about the moment. Let's catch as much fish, but they're killing the future. They're killing the future of catching fish, right? Because they're killing the reefs, they're killing, you know, it's just sad. You made it, you made us like smile of the beauty of the world, and then you made us sad at the then then two minutes later. Yeah. Really good filmmaking. Because you yeah, really it's, um... that our strings and told us show and showed us that. This is what's being, this is what we're doing, right? Yeah, I wanted to create an emotion of sadness in the audience yeah. because it is it is a quite sad story. Um, these um, Bajo people, they are so connected with the sea, but then on the other side, some of them, some individuals are also responsible, responsible for a lot of damage on the reefs because um, they sometimes turn to very harmful fishing methods just to make more money at the end of the day and create a bigger catch. So they are using dynamite, they're using harsh chemicals like potassium cyanide just to increase their numbers. And there is no pointing fingers, there's no blaming. It is not um, not deliberately choosing to destroy the reef. They're just trying to feed their families. So it was, um, it was a very sad experience for me to witness um, them having to take these very um, sad choices, making these very sad choices in order to survive. Mm -hmm. And you also show the the one gentleman uh, making a bomb, <laughs> right? Like uh, that was yeah. interesting. Yeah, it's. Um, I would like to add um, on that note that not all the bajo are involved with um, these very extreme destructive um, fishing methods. Yeah. There are people that really believe in the traditions and they choose to do net fishing 
they choose to do spear fishing, maybe line fishing, but in very traditional ways. But then there are people who um, have moved on and they are very open to um, modern ways like blast fishing using homemade uh, bombs. And it's something you see more and more, but not all the barjo participate in those activities. Yeah, so they 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 throw a bomb into the into the ocean. It makes an explosion underwater, and then the fish die, and they come up to the top, I guess, right? And they grab all the fish. So yeah, and there's some some um, very intense um, forms of doing that. So some of the people they um, they would travel for weeks um in to very remote areas of Indonesia um prepared with many kilograms of dynamite um so they would do a big fishing trip whereas other people use those bombs just to fish locally yeah. for the day coming back but there's also a very um um a very big international um a mechanism happening where the Bajo sell their big dynamite catches to middlemen who then sell it to other parts of Asia. So there's a huge story there and it's um there is it's it's hardly ever been recorded by camera because creating that access is is um very difficult. It's a very illegal line of work and people don't like to be filmed um doing those activities. And then you kind of end the movie showing the next generation, right? These kids are in school and in, in the school, they're part of this community and you're wondering, okay, what's, what's going to happen with this generation, right? Where it's, where are they going to go? Are they going to have to leave? They're going to, it's kind of like, they're, it's like, it's almost like, it's at almost the end of the line in a sense, right? Not to be overly dramatic, but it's like, I couldn't help but wonder what's going to happen with these kids. Yeah, me too. That was um, for me um, quite an emotional experience. Um, there's a lot of kids in the village, and I, um, some parents are quite forward thinking. There is a, a local school in in the village that I was visiting, and some of the parents really trying to find an alternative way for the future generation through education, but some of the families they. Um, don't really have a strong focus on that. The kids often don't attend the school altogether. And mm -hmm. I wonder what will happen with the future generations as well. And it makes me a little bit sad to think about it um, because they, their society and their communities will be changing a lot in the future with all the environmental factors playing into it. So, yeah. Um, yeah. Do you remember the the last line that you said in the film? The last line that said in the film? Yeah. It was um in my film ends on one of the main characters wishing for his children not to follow his footsteps yeah. and don't choose to be a fisherman. Yeah. It's sort of like saying that they, they were done. I'm the last of the generations and it's time for these kids to to like you said like like do something right be a fisherman be a doctor be be sorry not sorry be a teacher be a doctor but be an artist the, the one good guy's playing the guitar uh but don't but don't be a fisherman it's it's over so, yeah it's a hard life that's yeah. what he said it's a hard life yeah well it's 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 a great film it's like you you it, it's it really is it's 16 minutes uh obviously you passed your class whatever class that you had you're you're very you're a very talented photographer as well. I'm assuming you are you want to make bigger films. This is your future. This is what you want to do. You want to be a filmmaker. Thank you very much. Um, I do would love to. Um, um, sorry, let's start that again. I I'm very passionate about it, and I would love to work in that sector. Yeah. I would love to create um, environmental documentaries. Um, learn the ins and outs about the industry and be involved with um, impactful stories. So do you have another film that you're working on now or what are you up to right now? At the moment, I am doing a lot of underwater photography and filmmaking in Australia. Locally, there is a lot to discover. We have some incredible natural um, 
phenomenon happening right at my doorstep. So I'm filming the spider crab migration and the giant cuttlefish migration currently. And um, in the future, I will be going back to Europe and um, planning on creating more films um, and photos there. So you made two films, well, two films that are on your website, uh, that this film and then Serenity that you made as well, correct? Yes. Serenity was my first ever film. Um, it was a university project as well. Yeah. And it tells the story about female freedivers that dive in Cornwall, in cold water in the UK for the benefits of mental health. And you got and you got some on your website, on your on your YouTube channel, you got it has a lot of views. It's doing well. When you did so it's like people are watching it yeah i i found a lot of people um could really strongly resonate with um the subject because doing something for increasing and improving your own health and your mental health is um very relevant today maybe more than it has ever been so it's a it's an inspiration for a lot of people to get out there find a community and find a passion a hobby that makes you feel good yeah so okay so you're you're born in germany you went to school in the uk you're in australia now is that where you're going to reside for a bit you're going to stay in australia yeah i've been living here now for over a year but my plans start to return to Europe um, at the end of the year. So I have also some changes coming my way and I'm quite excited to um, yeah, see what's what's out there for me in Europe. Yeah, and obviously this film itself has, there's a bigger story here. You kind of alluded to it before, right? In terms of the commercialization, like the, the shadiness, I could say, my word's not yours, like the shadiness involved in this kind of like the fishing there's a huge documentary here. Would you ever consider going back and kind of like making a larger story about this? Absolutely. I was um, thinking about that for a while just because it is very relevant. And I think often um, perhaps consumers of seafood and fish, they might not think about the journey that the fish and seafood um, would have had and it's huge it's a huge international business um, the blast fishing the potassium cyanide fishing and I would love to be involved in almost like an investigative um, project where the story is really trying to unfold the steps of um, what happens from the very from the very moment a bomb is made to traveling all the way until it ends on our plate. And yeah. I think there's a lot to tell there. And um, I have created access to a lot of dynamite fishermen. And I'm positive that in the future, I can revisit that idea. Yeah, it's it's interesting. It's something, yeah. It's, yeah, there's something here. Well, you did the, you practically did this film all by yourself. It's kind of amazing. And uh, I know you got some, Good. You had some advisors. You you got some different music type of music that you use, but it's pretty great that what you did. So I can't I can't wait to see what you do, your next film is, and just keep making films. That's all I ask. Thank <laughs> you so much. <laughs> well, congratulations. Thanks, and yeah. Let's like let's talk again when you make your next film. Fantastic. I'm looking forward to that.